In this video, we will animate the nonlinear oscillator. The equations of motion for this system were derived in a previous video. If you haven't watched that yet, please stop this video and watch that first. A link to it appears above and also in the description below. As a starting point, I will repurpose code that I created in a previous video. To get to that code, you can go to this video of mine, Animating the Elastic Pendulum, 2D of F. And there's a link to the final code repository on GitHub. And all I'm going to use is these two files, the elasticpendulum.py and spring.py, which is a module that I import. So grab these two files and drop them in a folder, like I've done here. And that's it. That's the starting point. Then I'm going to rename this instead of Elastic Pendulum. We'll rename it to Nonlinear Oscillator. And then we're just going to drop this in here. And that's our starting point. So as always, we start off by changing definition of G here. And the starting point is, I'm going to change these variables. So it's x1 dot, x2 dot. And this would be x1 and x2. Okay, and then we're going to be returning x1 double dot, x2 double dot, x2 double dot, x1 dot, and x2 dot. Okay, so what goes in the middle? Let's just follow our definitions. R1 is just a vector, so we'll call it an umpire array. And it's L1 plus X1 and X2. And we can do the same thing for R2. Whoops, R2 is equal to NumPy array. And this one is X1, L2 plus X2. Easy enough. Then our definition of alpha, I'll call it capital A1, 1 minus L1 divided by, and the magnitude we'll write as the norm of R1. And in order to use that, we need to import it here from NumPy linear algebra, include norm. Similarly, we can define alpha2 as 1 minus L2 divided by the norm of R2. And then just the equation of motion, x1 double dot, is equal to, I'm just going to paste this in here to save us some time. I'm dividing by m, taking m to the other side and dividing by it. And that's it. My G routine done. Next, we have to change the update routine. This is now x1 and x2. And I can get rid of this part, the sine and the cosine part. And then this will just be scale times x1 and scale times x2. The only thing I need to remember here is a negative sign because x2 is positive upwards. And in terms of plotting to the screen, the y-axis is positive downwards. So next, we've got to change our render routine. You know, I can take this x and y out. I'm just noticing. Let's copy this. Instead of x and y here, we'll put point. And down here at the bottom, instead of x and y, we'll put point. And every time I see x and y, I'm just going to replace that by point. Okay. We can get rid of the spring update for now. I'll draw all that in later. This line can come out. And in fact, all we need is just our mass. I think that's okay for now. And I'll start drawing the other stuff later as soon as it seems like it's working properly. I know I want to shift the offset, and this is just experimental. Instead of at W over 2, I'm going to have it at 3 fifths of the width. And instead of a quarter of the height, I'm going to have it at 2 fifths of the height. And this is just from playing around with it. Scale, I'm going to put up to 200. And then down here, just changing the parameters. The mass, I'll make a little bit bigger at 8. Uh, L0 goes away. It's now L1. We'll just set that equal to 1 arbitrarily. Same thing with L2. And then we have a K1 and K2. I'll make this reasonably soft at 10. Again, this is just arbitrary. Oops. And so the only thing I need to change here are my initial conditions. To begin with, you'll see why I'm doing this, just so there's uh, no coupling and really just moves in one direction. I'm going to stretch it one unit or 0.1 unit in the x1 and in the x2 direction and then release it. 
and I'm just going to comment this out for now. We'll deal with the springs in a second as soon as we find that this is working properly. Okay, so let's run this. So it's pip and run Python, and we called it nonlinear oscillator.py. Oh, typo. Okay, so it seems to be working. I mean, we could speed it up a little bit to be sure. I'm going to go here. Okay, so next I'm going to draw my springs. I'm going to take this spring here. We're going to have two springs. So I'll call them S1 and S2. Initialize both of them. Um, I don't care much for the position because we're going to update that before we draw it. But this I want to change a little bit in terms of the number of coils and the width. And this was just from aesthetics and from, from playing with it a little bit. This will be scale divided by 4. Same thing here, scale. This is just to make the sizing a little bit dynamic as I scale it up and down. Same thing here, scale divided by 10. And you'll see in a little bit what the purpose of this is. It's just so I can run it at different scales, depending on the size of the displacement. I'll say S1 update. And we want to update it. It's going to go from P1 to point. I know I need to define P1 above. We'll do that in a second. S2 will just go from P2 to point. And this should not be indented. And then I just want to render each of them. So I can go S1 render. And same thing, S2 render. So all I need to do is add points P1 and P2. And this will be done in the form of a tuple. And it's minus L1 times scale uh, plus offset, offset 0. And it would just be offset 1 in the other direction. Just remember that point P1 is at minus L and 0. The reason I'm scaling it is because I'm scaling everything. And then I'm adding the offset. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing with P2. P2 would be at offset 0, and this would be L2 times scale. In fact, it uh, would be positive in this case. And the reason it's positive is because of the difference in the coordinate systems between plotting and the model itself. The only other thing to do is these need to be integers, so I'm just going to wrap these in an int just in case. Same thing here. This is an int. And then this one is an int. And let's run it again. It's out of range. Oh my goodness, this should be offset one, not offset two. That's silly. S2 is not defined. Did we not call it S2 down here? Oh, I never changed this to S2. That's why. Silly. I think that looks pretty good. I think I can improve the aesthetics a little. So let's do this. In the render routine, what we're going to do here is draw another circle. And we'll make this one black. And this will just be a P1. So just be a little dot that looks like a hinge. And we'll make this size 8. And we'll do the exact same thing for point 2, I think. I'm going to make the circle a little bit smaller, M times 5. The one other thing I want to do is draw a line that connects the bases of the two springs. And I'll do it here. Hi game, draw line, and I'd like that to go into the trace layer, in fact. Make it yellow, it goes from point 0.1 to point 0.2, and we'll give it a thickness of 2. And this will come in useful a little bit later. Let's have another look at it. And I realize that yellow is not defined. And we'll define yellow as 240, 240, and 0.
Yeah, that seems to be working fine. And the reason for that yellow line you'll appreciate later is that if this mass passes that yellow line, it's actually going to want to snap through that and then start oscillating on the other side of the line. But we'll see that in a little bit. I think while I'm at it, I'm just going to draw a mark at the equilibrium position. We'll do it here. So it's pi gain draw screen red and we draw it right at the offset and we'll make it size 2. Okay, so let's have a look at an example. What I'm going to do is just displace it in the x1 direction and I'm going to make a very small displacement and I'm going to scale this up very large so we can still see the effects of it. So if I go to scale and I make this say 10,000 Let's run this and take a look. And what I'm hoping to show is that under very small displacements, this behaves like the simple harmonic isolator. There you can see the red dot, which is the equilibrium position. And you can see this is oscillating linearly about that equilibrium position. Very small oscillations. I've scaled it up tremendously. OK, so let's make this a little bit bigger and see what happens, right? If I now make the scale a little bit smaller, let's take it down to 1,000. And let's make the initial displacement 10 times bigger and now run it. And what you should see now is a little bit of the coupling in the x2 direction. Probably not a lot because it's still quite a small displacement. You can see it shifting off that red dot slightly. All right, so let's make it a little bit bigger. Now you can see based on the trail that there is some play in the x2 direction. We'll make it bigger still. So let's change this to, say, 0.3, and we'll change our scale maybe to 350. Let's run that. So there you can clearly see that even though the initial displacement is in the x direction only, you get a coupling between the x1 and x2 directions. Makes this nonlinear. And just to show the nonlinearity, let's displace it a little bit more in the x1 direction. Now, in the case of a linear oscillator, you would expect that if I increased from 0.3 to 0.5, all that would happen is that the displacement would increase accordingly. But in this case, we find that the path looks altogether different. So clearly, the response is very highly dependent on the nature of the initial displacement or the initial state. Now let's try something else. Let's give it a little bit more of a displacement. 0.7. Now the nonlinearity in the system really shows itself. You get the snap-through condition, which makes the response altogether different. And in fact, you should notice that there's now an equilibrium position on each side of that yellow line. You can see how it's vibrating now. Let's give it yet another different initial condition. And this time I'll bring the scaling down a little bit just so we can truly see it. And I'm just going to add some displacement now in the x2 direction as well as the x1 direction. Very interesting, right? Could you have predicted anything like this? So I think the one thing I want to add is a little red dot in equilibrium position on the other side of the yellow line. That can be done quite easily as follows. Let's go to where we drew this line here. Let's copy it. And instead of offset, we'll call this offset 2, which we need to define. And offset 2 would be minus L1 times scale and L2 times scale. Remember that we've got to add the offset. This would be offset 1, and this here would be offset 0. And I'm going to take an integer. I want to make sure it's an int. So I'm just going to wrap this with an int.
And that should be it. For good measure, let's set it in motion one more time. Maybe this time I will make the second spring very, very weak. We'll see how that changes things. And there you have it. I'll remind you that spring two, which is the spring on the right right now, is much weaker than spring number one. You can kind of see it in the motion. Spring number one is totally dominating spring number two. Now we could end the video here. Everything is working. Only I don't think you would have learned anything because I made it very clear in the previous video where we derived these equations that a way, way better way to do this is to find everything in vector form. Why? Because ultimately, when you get to more complicated problems, it's going to make things much, much easier for you. So let's go back and let's redefine G using our alternate equations. All right, so what I'm going to do is just rename this G2, and I'm going to define a new G here of YT. This way we can compare and contrast them. All I'm going to do here is write the equations. Um, let me put them up on the screen for you, and then we're just going to copy them. So first we started with E1. It's just a unit vector. We'll make it a NumPy array. And this is just 1, 0. Similarly, E2 is just 0, 1. All right, then we define R1. And R1, again, we'll use a NumPy array. And then this is just L1 plus X1. In fact, we've got the definition here. I'm just going to copy it. Don't have to redo it. All right, now we can find the ER1 and ER2 vectors. That is just equal to R1 divided by its norm. And the same thing for ER2 is equal to R2 divided by its norm. Now we can calculate the deflection in the springs. Delta 1 is just equal to the norm of R1 minus L1. So the norm of R1 minus L1. And similarly for delta 2, we can say that it's the norm of R2 minus L2. This makes it dead simple to find the forces. We have the formula for that. It's minus K1 times delta 1 times ER1. And similarly, F2 is minus K2 times delta 2 times ER2. And that's it. Now we can find the equations of motion, which are dead simple, right? X1 double dot is just equal to the force divided by the mass. But the force is F1 plus F2. And what I need to do is I need to dot this with the E1 direction. So actually, it's numpy dot. F1 plus F2 with the E1 direction divided by M. That's it. That's the equation of motion. In fact, I can duplicate the second one, make this X2, and then this would just be dotted with E2. And that's identical. And now all we're going to do is return it just like we did before. I can copy and paste that. X1 is not defined. Oh, I need to add the slide at the beginning. I did not pass the state vector. I wonder if it doesn't see that. That's it. Let's run it again. Delta 2 is not defined. Ah, oh, I made a typo. Sorry, guys. So why did I do this? Why did I have you do it this way? Because if we look at the equations of motion, clearly G, as I've called it, is slightly more lengthy than G2. But let me remind you, in order to get the equations of motion in this form that we have up here, look at all the math that we did to get here. Just look at all the math. Look at all the room for error. 
And what we did is we felt like we needed to find these equations of motion in explicit form, as opposed to having the computer do the substitutions for you. The problem is that as these problems get more and more complicated, I mean, imagine if there were four, five, six, ten springs. It's going to get really, really complicated mathematically to do it the old way. Whereas this new method I've shown you will make it a lot cleaner. Try to extend it to 3D. In 3D, your displacements and your expressions for deflections of the spring will get very complicated indeed. So I'm going to end this video just by running a problem we saw earlier, where we make this 10 again. There you have it. This is very similar to what you saw before. I didn't mention it earlier, but I should mention the way that these nonlinear systems vibrate is known as a limit cycle oscillation, or an LCO. And you can see it here, that what happens is this mass embarks on a trajectory, and it's very dependent on the exact initial conditions. Slightly different initial conditions will cause this to run on a completely different trajectory. I think that's all I'm going to say about this video. A link to the code repository is in the description below. So feel free to play with it as much as you want. Test out your own theories. I hope you found something useful in this video. If you did, please go ahead and smash those like buttons so that others can get to see it. If you have any questions or feel like you did not get your value for money out of this video, I would like to hear from you in the comment section below. If you'd like to hear about new videos as they release, please go ahead and subscribe and hit those bell buttons. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch up with you in the next video.